right now. San Antonio police now investigating a case that led to an officer shooting a man in the leg after that man jumped out of a second story window. Yeah, Alyssa Cole explains why the officer says she pulled the trigger. At this apartment complex on Cullinite Boulevard near I-10 and Wurzbach, officers responded to a disturbance just before midnight on Tuesday. And when they arrived, a female officer spotted a man outside of the building. He had just jumped out of a second story window. And according to police, no one was expecting what the man was about to do next. He pulls a weapon and recordedly pull, uh, points it at her. She fires one round, striking the, sub, the suspect in the leg. The man was taken to a hospital for treatment. According to preliminary reports, before he jumped out the window, the man allegedly assaulted a woman, which led to the initial 911 call. A female complainant was reportedly being beaten by the male. And from witness reports, her face was all swollen and bruised. Wow, uh, when the officers arrived. The chief says because everything is preliminary information, details could change as the investigation carries out. But as of right now, he's taking the officer off of patrol. To be placed on administrative leave as is routine for officer involved shootings uh, until further notice. Chief McManus says that officer has only been on patrol for a year. And as far as the woman, we have no update on her condition as of now. As soon as we learn more information, we'll keep you updated in our later newscast and online. Reporting in San Antonio, Alyssa Cole, Case at 12 News. We want to bring you to some late breaking news this noon. Right now, firefighters on the scene of a northwest side fire. Tiffany Huerta is joining us live near Loop 410 and Bandera Road. So Tiffany, what's the latest? Well, a spokesperson for the fire department says no one was injured, but take a look. They are still here trying to figure out what exactly happened. Several families were in these apartments, and as you can see, some of them are a complete loss. Investigators are just trying to figure out how it started, but they believe it could have started between the floors of these apartments. Now, the fire is contained at this moment. Residents are going to be moved to other properties, but they are devastated. Some just figuring out what to do next. Right now, they are checking for hotspots, but as you can see, there is a lot of damage at these apartments. Um, this hits really close to home for some people that were just around here and they were just waking up or smelling this. And we have some pictures that we're gonna bring to you of how this fire started and we're gonna have the latest coming up in later in the newscast. We'll send it back to you. All right, thank you, Tiffany. Taking a look outside at live cam, 64 degrees. We know what's coming, a little bit of yeah. cold, but uh, right now it's it's not bad, it's pretty mild. It's not bad, so spring breakers who are you know celebrating right now are, are doing just fine. Tomorrow's gonna be warm, <laughs> it'll be good. But yes, then the change is coming, and big changes. We've got severe thunderstorms potentially, and then some really cold air that will work its way in towards the end of the week, still on schedule. Uh, let's look at the cloud cover right now. We've got clouds, it, it, this is almost reminiscent of yesterday where we had thicker clouds out west, and then breaks as you go east here in San Antonio. We're kind of right on the dividing line, but the sun is out in several spots, and that's allowing temperatures to jump up into the mid 60s at this hour. A little cloudier off to the east and or off to the west, I should say, and that has kept temperatures down. 60 in Uvalde, still in the 50s in Rock Springs and Carrizo Springs. 61 in Del Rio, where it is mostly sunny. 67 right now in Kennedy and around San Antonio. We're looking in mid 60s at this hour. There's the scene. Uh, mostly cloudy skies for the airport. Two points at 49 and rising thanks to east southeast Julie winds at 13. So you'll start to feel the humidity a little bit more later tonight and into tomorrow for sure. 70 by 3 o'clock, 71 to 4 o'clock. We'll take it up to about 72 by 5 p.m. And then look for clouds to stay in place for night. Then we'll start to add in some very small rain chances, some light showers possible tomorrow morning before uh, we start to talk about thunderstorms, and some of which, again, could be strong. Damaging winds are going to be the main threat, and this is late Thursday night, early in the Friday morning. Then on Friday, windy and cold, gusts of 40 miles per hour, wind chills in the 30s. Sunday and Monday are going to be cold and damp, too. A lot to talk about in the forecast, and we're going to get you updated. We've got the latest computer models. We'll show them to you coming up here in just a few minutes, guys. All right. Thank you, Justin. See you in a bit. San Antonio police investigating a chase turn standoff that ended in a shooting on the city's southeast side yesterday. The situation involved one man and several law enforcement agencies. 
Images from Sky 12 videos show the swarm of law enforcement surrounding the suspect inside that silver vehicle you see on your screen. San Antonio Police Chief William McManus says this all started when officers tried to stop the man who had an active felony warrant for domestic violence. We're told the man took off, but law enforcement tracked him down near South Cross Ranch Road, just east of Loop 410. The officers attempted to stop him. He fled down South Cross. He's down there about probably close to a half mile. Uh, he had a gun. There was a female in the car with him. He, he was in possession of a handgun. She was able to get out of the car uh, at some point. And we're told at some point during the standoff, the suspect held the gun to his own head and then pointed it towards officers. That prompted those officers to open fire. The man was taken to a nearby hospital. SAPD is currently reviewing body cam footage. Uvalde City Council unanimously approving an updated memorandum of understanding between the city's police department and Uvalde CISD. It all happened during last night's city council meeting. So this memorandum of understanding, it was already approved back in September, but last night the city and the council unanimously agreeing that Uvalde City Police and the school district officers, they can share interchangeable leading authority in any necessary event. For example, if there was an emergency situation happening at a Uvalde CISD school and the city police officers are on campus and have the ability to safely take action, they can do so as long as they communicate their actions to the school district police officers. Now to Russia, where a Russian warplane forced down an American drone over the Black Sea. ABC's Rena Roy takes a look at how tensions between the U.S. and Russia are ramping up. Amid significant tensions between the U.S. and Russia, a Russian warplane colliding with an unmanned American drone. Two Russian fighter jets making 19 passes at high speed by the Reaper surveillance drone over the Black Sea in international airspace, spraying it with fuel multiple times. Then one jet flying vertically towards the drone, hitting its rear propeller and bending it. The U.S. then guiding the drone away into the sea. This hazardous episode is a part of a pattern of aggressive and risky and unsafe actions by Russian pilots in international airspace. So make no mistake, the United States will continue to fly and to operate wherever international law allows. A U.S. Air Force official tells ABC this does not appear to be intentional. At the very least looks like this was just reckless behavior by a, a Russian pilot. The Russians are claiming the drone was flying southwest of the Crimean Peninsula towards Russia's border and crashed because of sharp maneuvering that the Russian jets never came into physical contact with the drone. The search is now on for that multi-million dollar drone, though U.S. officials have acknowledged it's a tough task. Should anything be taken by the Russians, uh, their ability to exploit uh, useful intelligence will be uh, highly minimized. That said, it's our property uh, and uh, obviously we're looking, we're looking to see uh, what we can do to maybe recover. It, that will be challenging in the Black Sea and it's very, very deep water. Russian authorities say they will try to recover the drone as well, though it appears they're also aware of the difficulty of this task. In a statement blasting the U.S., saying in part, Americans keep saying they are not participating in hostilities, but this is yet another confirmation that they are directly involved in the war. Rena Roy, ABC News, New York. All right, well, the number of Alzheimer's patients is expected to rise significantly over the next three decades. So coming up in the next half hour, a leader from the Alzheimer's Association joins us live to talk about some of the research currently underway to help treat the disease. And go Spurs, go a huge win here at home. How it happened and how Zach Collins, MVP of the team right now. Feeling lucky? Happening today, the top prize for the Lotto Texas is growing. It's now sitting at the biggest jackpot in more than 12 years after 76 drawings without a winner. So the current estimated jackpot in today's drawing, $53.5 million in estimated cash value of $33.1 million. That is the largest Lotto Texas prize since May 29th of 2010. Back then, the jackpot reached an estimated $97 million. So are you guys going to play? I mean, I'm not always big on the lotto, but I uh -huh. guess, you know, 
maybe. Might as well throw I'll consider it. Money. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right, so while you might need a lot of luck to win, you know, $33.1 million <laughs> cash, you don't need a lot of luck to enjoy the St. Patty's Day Festival and Parade. Yeah, today organizers showed off decorated floats ahead of the event. This year, the fun kicks off during spring break. Crews will be downtown dyeing the river green on Friday and Saturday. 25 gallons of eco-friendly green dye will be released. And there will actually be two parades this year. Both will have 12 Irish themed floats. St. Patrick's Day River Parade has been around for more than 50 years and it's not just the parades. The celebration also includes entertainment and vendors. You might even hear some bagpipes. So I guess the big question is, will it be good weather for these parades? Uh, well, that is the good question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we do know that it is going to be uh, sort of cloudy and cool this week. Other than tomorrow, we get some warmer weather. We get those temperatures into the 80s. Uh, the aquifer still falling. This is not good news. We're down six tenths of a foot to 633.4, and we're getting into pumping season. So we know the aquifer is going to continue to go down unless we get some rain, and there is some in the forecast. The pollen count, oak is high at 830. Pine is moderate. Bolts, Heckberry, and Mulberry all there. We'll talk about this active forecast and our chance for storms coming up tomorrow night after the break. All right, welcome back. So I will say I was a little melodramatic yesterday when I talked about the weather. It ended up being beautiful out there. <laughs> yes, thank you for admitting that. I do. It takes I, a big man. I do admit it. It was a great day for kayaking <laughs> yesterday. I know it might not have been, but it ended up being fantastic, Justin. So I, I know I Justin appreciates, yeah, appreciates I the apology. I, I mean, do. Yeah. we know that the weather coming in is going to be a little extreme towards the end of the week, but yep. I mean, we really need any rain that could come, anything to wash away the you know, that, that's a really good point. And I just mentioned the aquifer, too. We need the rain, so we'll take it. I, it uh, we, we may get some severe weather tomorrow, but once we get into Sunday and Monday, could just be some good soaking rain. Yes, it'll be cold. That's okay if we get some rain at this point because we desperately, desperately need it. Uh, let's first start with the satellite picture. I'll show you where the clouds are. As I mentioned earlier, we're kind of right on the dividing line here in San Antonio. We're sitting at 65 degrees. East of here, you'll find a lot more sun. If you go west, you'll run into more cloud cover. And the clouds will keep temperatures down in spots today. So places like Uvalde, Rock Springs, uh, down towards uh, Carrizo Springs, you're going to see the cooler weather. As you go east with more sun, temperatures are already jumping up into the 70s in a few spots, including Victoria. Here around Bear County, we are in the mid-60s, 62 Holotus, but 65 the airport, 66 over at Randolph, and mostly cloudy skies as we go outside for you. The sun's still shining through several spots here in town. Dew point is at 49 and it is on the rise as southeast Julia winds usher in some good Gulf moisture. That will turn into some shower and storm activity by tomorrow. Forecast temperatures this afternoon. We should make it up to about 72 or so, even with the cloud cover. 69 Bernie, 68 Kerrville, 73 in Pearsall today. Uh, all in all, quiet, nice day. Tomorrow it gets a little bit warmer and I mentioned we have the higher dew points starting to move in. So by tomorrow, dew points will be close to 70. That's spring-like. Temperatures will be in the 80s, and that's going to be enough energy to get some storms going before our front comes through, and then the bottom falls out, and we get dry air moving in here. Here's the storm system that we're watching. It's uh, out over parts of Southern California now. You see the rain there in Arizona, and that is moving in our direction. Some of that energy will arrive uh, we think by tomorrow afternoon, this is where we're expecting severe weather or the possibility of severe weather. Now, the highest risk is up here around Dallas, where you're going to see numerous severe uh, shower, or numerous storms, I should say. And then as you go south, you run into more scattered activity. And that includes here in San Antonio, where on a scale of about one to five or to two, we talked a little bit about this yesterday. And it looks like they've expanded it a little bit further west. So most of our area is within this scattered risk. Gusty winds are going to be the main issue with gusts up to 70 miles per hour, some of these storms along the front. So that's what we'll be watching for tomorrow night. This is mainly uh, after sunset on Thursday into early, early Friday morning. So let me walk you through it uh, here with the forecast. Mostly cloudy this afternoon. As we get into tomorrow morning, we start to add in a few showers, sprinkly light showers mostly. It could be a little bit damp in spots as that moisture really surges in. Midday tomorrow, still a few showers by 5 o'clock. This model has things pretty quiet. If we can get a thunderstorm going tomorrow afternoon, there could be a strong storm or two. But most of the models don't really show that. So it's not until 
late tomorrow night, around 10 o'clock, that we start to see storms developing along our frontal boundary, and then they uh, become a little more robust by, say, midnight into 1 a.m., the 60% chance of rain. And then by 3 a.m. Friday, pretty widespread showers and storms. This is where we could see some of that severe weather. Uh, even behind the front, we could see some stronger storms, maybe with a little bit of hail. Just one other component we'll be watching. Uh, by Friday morning, still some scattered showers around 30% chance. But at this point, it's windy and it's cold. We'll look at the forecast wind gust Friday morning, 8 a.m. Gusting close to 40 miles per hour. You combine that with the chilly temperatures. That's the wind chill. That's what it's going to feel like Friday morning. 37 here in town. Could feel like it's in the low 30s in the hill country. It'll be a shock to the system uh, considering where we've been. Then beyond that, we get more rain chances coming in on Saturday, just a 20% chance, but temperatures only near 50. By Sunday, highs only in the upper 40s, rain chances near 40%. And then on Monday, probably one of our best chances of rain, still about 40% or so, uh, but it'll be one of those days where it's just kind of damp and cold, temperatures only around 47 or so. Uh, and you know, we, we talked about the last couple of days, maybe a flake or two in the hill country really doesn't even look that likely at this point. And if we did see that, it would cause zero impact. So that's not really uh, uh, an issue. And as we look at the extended forecast, 80 on Thursday, tomorrow, 52 Friday, that's the big drop. And then 50 Saturday, which is a small chance for shower, but better chances Sunday and Monday, as we showed you. That means highs will only be in the upper 40s for highs. And then we do moderate some by Tuesday, 60 degrees. But what a stretch here. Be ready for the cold, guys. I'm ready. Jackets out. I like Umbrellas it. out. Yep. Thank you, Justin. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> All right, go Spurs, go. Look, if you don't want to deal with the weather, stay home. Watch the Spurs. They're on a win streak. At least they might be starting one. Big numbers from some big rookies. And of course, March Madness. We are in the thick of it. We're going to be talking about, of course, Texas A&M, the Aggies. We'll talk about UT a little bit too. Don't worry, Courtney, I won't forget you. <laughs> Thank you. All that and more right after the break. Spurs go to silver and black, hosting the Magic at the AT&T Center. So we got a lot of people out. Keldon, Malachi, Romeo, and Trey not suiting up for this one. Let's take a look. First quarter, here's a guy who did suit up. Jeremy Sohan with the board and the slam. Spurs first lead of the game, 11-8. Part of a Spurs 9-0 run. Timeout Magic later again from three. Jeremy with the range. Spurs lead 26-17. Then after the first quarter, Blake Wesley wasn't looking right in the face. Not great. KBD with that pass. Spurs led by nine after one second quarter. Charles Bassey bounce pass to Blake Wesley. Slam dunk. That ball ball just can't stop. Speaking of him, he's 7-2 when he passes the ball behind his back to Cole Anthony for three. Spurs lead down to five, but San Antonio led by six at half. So what happens after that? The third quarter. And look at that. Way beyond the arc. Devin Vassell shooting, draining a three. A little later, Jemmy Sohan good from downtown. Spurs lead big, 91-74. Made seven of 11 threes to lead by whew, nine, heading to the fourth quarter. Cue up KBD for another triple and a good, good night for the Spurs. Their original franchise record for threes in a game was 21, and guess what? They broke it. They had 22 threes, and the Spurs roll the magic 132-114. to Zach and... Uh... Jeremy were outstanding. Uh, they were special tonight. If you make 22 threes, you're going to have a pretty damn good night. That's just the way the rules are. We don't do that very often, but we did it tonight, uh, and it was fun to watch. Uh, more importantly, we had 39 assists, uh, which is really fantastic. So all in all, it was a good night for the boys. It was a great night for the boys. So Spurs back in action tomorrow, hosting the Mavericks at 7.30. All right. Speaking of basketball, how about them Aggies in the Midwest region? The seventh seeded Aggies of Texas A&M will hoop up with the number 10 seed Penn State Nittany Lions tonight, first full day of men's action. That's actually tomorrow night. Aggies head coach Buzz Williams will be taking his third different team to the NCAA tournament. Also took Marquette and Virginia Tech, advanced to the Elite Eight back in 2012. Buzz, who was named the SEC Co-Coach of the Year, has the Aggies back in the tournament for the first time since 2018. Thrilled to have the team in March Madness. Not necessarily a fan of how much longer March Madness games take to play. I think you have to be efficient with your words, 
but it can't be too wordy. But you have to figure out a way to be engaged during all of those breaks. I think each break's two and a half minutes. That's when the horn sounds, which means it's three minutes before the ball's back in play. And three minutes in real time, uh, you know, when you're win or go home, I, I think that that kind of wears on you. All right, so Penn State, Texas A&M playing Thursday night, 8.55 from the Wells Fargo Arena in Des Moines. A&M now favored by three and a half points. And of course, Texas, Texas UT, speaking of the horns, mm -hmm. taking on Colgate. All right, the horns. All right, changes coming to Hemisphere Park, and the city wants to know what you think. Still ahead, Tiffany Huertas with what the city is considering and how you can make your voice heard. And a new report says the number of Alzheimer's patients expected to double by 2050. After the break, the Alzheimer's Association joining us to discuss this new report and what is being done. All right, taking you back to that late breaking news we first brought you at the top of our show. Right now, firefighters are still on the scene of a northwest side fire at an apartment complex. Tiffany Huerta is joining us live near Loop 410 and Bandera Road. So, Tiffany, what's the latest? We're getting more information as the investigation continues, but they do still believe that this fire could have started between the first and second floor. Now, take a look. Several families were in these apartments when the fire started. Officials say no one was injured, but San Antonio Fire Department Public Information Officer Joel Arrington says the fire started around 11 a.m. When firefighters arrived here, evacuations were already underway. Investigators are still trying to determine the cause of this fire. Uh, this building has 16 apartments. Twelve of those were occupied at the time. Arrington says six units had severe fire and water damage. Residents are right now being relocated to other apartments here or other properties, and they're still trying to figure out what's next. Coming up in the 5 and 6 p.m. newscast, we're going to hear from some of those residents living in these apartments and what exactly happened when they when they found out all this fire and everything was happening around them. We're going to send it back to you, Max and Courtney. Thank you, Tiffany. All right, so despite some progress, Alzheimer's disease poses a growing concern across the United States. Today, we have a release of the 2023 Alzheimer's Disease Facts and Figures Report, and it highlights some of the top issues now and even gives us a glimpse into the future. Yeah, according to the Alzheimer's Association, the number of patients is expected to double by the year 2050, resulting in 13 million people with the affliction. We're joined now by Greg Shudo, the executive director of the Alzheimer's Association. Greg, thank you so much for joining us this noon. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Well, the report states that more Americans are living with the disease, which all of us can relate to this. I feel like everyone knows somebody suffering from this, and we know it's a leading cause of death. So a big question is, is the disease becoming more prevalent or are we just becoming more aware of it? So the short answer would be yes. Uh, I think we are becoming more aware of, of the disease. I think people are, are the, the concern is growing. People are paying more attention to, to their mental, uh, mental cognition. But also, people are living longer, right? And the number one risk factor for Alzheimer's and dementia is age. So I, I think as the baby boomers continue to age and the future generations continue to age and live longer, uh, it's only going to become more an issue. Now, oh, Greg, you, you saw the report. What really jumped out to you when you saw all the facts and the figures? So every year we, we see the qualitative data. This year, 6.7 million Americans are estimated to be living with Alzheimer's or dementia. The cost on the nation is expected to be $345 billion, uh, billion with a B. Uh, we, we know that one in three seniors die with Alzheimer's or related dementia. I think the thing that stuck out to me this year was there was qualitative data associated as well. So there were focus groups with People that have have not de developed dementia, uh, their primary care physicians talking about why they're hesitant to ask for a diagnosis. And that is more important than ever to ask for a diagnosis because we actually have FDA approved treatments that can slow the progression of the disease in some, some individuals. So getting that proper diagnosis and overcoming the stigma of a diagnosis is very, very important. And this year's report reflects that. And that's exactly what I was going to ask next. Can you talk about just some of the research and medications that the public should know about? Because we know that there are a lot out there. 
Sure. Yeah. So in the last two years, the FDA has approved two drugs that actually attack the underlying biology of Alzheimer's disease. These are not cures. I just want to be very clear about that. But for the first time in the 100 plus year history that we've known about Alzheimer's disease, uh, we have something that can actually attack the underlying or the hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the research surrounding that, though, is more diverse than it's ever been. So we're not focusing on this one uh, amyloid reduction therapy as the as the magic bullet to cure Alzheimer's disease, but it is an important step in seeing if we can reduce the progression or slow the progression of the disease, give folks more time, and ultimately uh, retain their memories for longer, live a better quality of life for longer. Uh, there's a ton of great research happening globally, but right here in San Antonio as well with the Biggs Institute. Uh, San Antonio is a hotbed for, for Alzheimer's disease research led by Dr. Sashadri and her team at Biggs. Uh, and we're, we're grateful to, to be able to support their work here in our community as well. In terms of local funding, you know, how is the association here, the local chapter, how are you guys doing in terms of fundraising and any events that you have coming up? Well, we are always looking for support. Uh, we, we can only do... Uh, so much in the community, but everything that we do is free of charge. So, so we're always looking for people to support us. I would, I would recommend folks visit ALZ.org uh, to see what events are happening in the area. We have community education ranging from Know the Ten Signs or Understanding the Basics of Dementia, all the way up to responding to dementia-related behaviors that happen on a regular basis. Uh, we have fundraising events, obviously, awareness events happening year-round. You can find all of that out at ALZ.org. Our walk here in San Antonio, October 21st at Fiesta, Texas. October 21st. All right, Greg Schuto from the Alzheimer's Association, thank you so much for being with us and your insightful intake. Thank you. All right, time to take a live look out at the Alamo City. 66 degrees. I'll be a little pessimistic. I don't see any blue skies there. I don't see any sunshine. <laughs> I'm not trying to be a pessimist here, Justin, but I'm just kind of getting people ready for, I guess, the incoming storms. Max, how can we make you happy, man? What do you need? <laughs> it's I impossible. Need, I need 75 and sunny. <laughs> That's what I need. We'll see. Maybe <laughs> next week. Maybe next week. Uh, we do need to look at the travel delays across the country. There are some in places like Arizona where there's heavy rain coming down. And then also down in Florida around Orlando where they've got some storms at the moment. Of course, that's a busy travel hub uh, this time of year. Let's look at the... Uh, the maps here and you can see Phoenix about a 30 minute delay and then down in Orlando. I know it's hard to see there, but about a 30 minute delay there as well. The rest of the country, rest of the major hubs doing OK. That includes here in Texas because things are still quiet. Temperature wise, 65 degrees at the airport, 60 Bandera, 66 Divine. 68 in Pleasanton, and we talked about earlier the fact that uh, we've got more sun as you go east of town, and then you'll find quite a bit more cloud coverage to go west, so the temperatures there are a little bit cooler. The case at 12-hour forecast, 70 at 3 o'clock. We top out at 72 today, mostly cloudy skies. We'll see more clouds than sun. Sorry, Max. And then tonight, we'll start to add in a few showers into the forecast. Light stuff, but we could see some showers even tomorrow morning for the morning commute. And then we turn our attention to tomorrow night when things become far more active. Make sure you have that KSAT weather app ready to go where we'll be sending out updates over the next couple days. But we'll talk more about that threat for storms tomorrow night, plus the arrival of that cooler weather. We'll time it out for you here in just a few minutes. Thank you, Justin. All right, not a great day to check the 401k, that's for sure. Fall continues after the Silicon Valley bank collapse. Uh, and it's having reverberations around the world and, of course, around the country. ABC's Justin Finch reports two federal agencies now investigating what exactly happened. Silicon Valley Bank now at the center of two federal investigations. The uh, SEC and the Department of Justice both will be interested in who knew what when and who did what when. The Department of Justice and the Securities and Exchange Commission carrying out separate probes looking for answers into the collapse of what was the nation's 16th largest bank. Two people familiar with the situation tell ABC News the DOJ and SEC investigations are in their early stages and it's unclear if any wrongdoing has been committed. Sources telling ABC News the FBI's early focus is on Silicon Valley Bank's leadership and if there's any evidence of possible insider trading. According to SEC filings, two top Silicon Valley executives sold shares in the company shortly before its collapse. 
A trust held by CEO Greg Becker sold nearly $3.6 million of SVB stock less than two weeks before the firm disclosed extensive losses that led to the bank's failure. I'm really grateful that the federal government did step in at the right time. Um, and this is, I think, about as good of an outcome as we could have hoped for. Meantime, new reports that Signature Bank shareholders are suing three former top executives at that bank, accusing them of fraudulently claiming it was financially strong just three days before the bank was taken over by regulators. The lawsuit asserting Signature misrepresented and failed to disclose adverse facts. And the Federal Reserve also conducting an internal review of its oversight of Silicon Valley Bank. But Senator Elizabeth Warren wants Fed Chairman Jerome Powell to recuse himself, saying policies he supports allow banks like SVB to profit off risky investments. Justin Finch, ABC News, Washington. Well, some Medicare beneficiaries could start paying less for certain prescriptions. The Department of Health and Human Services says starting next month, the out-of-pocket cost is dropping for 27 drugs. Seniors could save between 200 and 390 bucks per average dose for these medications. This initiative is part of the Inflation Reduction Act. It requires drug companies to pay a rebate to Medicare if they raise their prices faster than inflation. All right, still coming up, the EPA says it's focusing on our drinking water, what the agency has planned in order to make it safer for everyone.